everyone. Before we get stuck into today's News Agent podcast, I just wanted to say that the sound quality does dip in a couple of areas, so I do apologise for that. But hopefully you'll find the conversation interesting and useful regardless. So on with the podcast. Hi, everyone, and welcome to the News Agent podcast. I'm Susie Lysett, Senior Content Executive at Goodlord. And today we'll be taking a look at the build to rent sector in the context of the current lack of stock. So could it be a potential solution for those supply issues that are out there? And we'll be looking to answer that question. And to help me look through that topic, I'm joined by Mark Gray, Director at Elevation Estate Agents, an agency operating across Milton Keynes and Cambridge. So thanks for joining me today, Mark. Thank you, Susie. Yes, it's good to, good to join you today. Just as um, as you said, I'm um, Letting's Director at the Elevation Property Group uh, we, with offices in Milton Keynes, Bedford and Cambridge. I've been an estate agent in Milton Keynes now since 1987, so we've seen quite a bit um, introduced and changed over those years. And of course, um, in addition to other legislative changes um, that will be affecting the private rental sector as we move through, um, we now have the um, the likelihood that the build to rent sector will start to play a, an influencing role in terms of how that structure moves itself forward. Yeah, no, I, I realise that in uh, especially in the Milton Keynes area, it is a, it is a part of the sector that is growing and uh, you know becoming more popular, as it were, for for investors and so on. But I, I think that obviously we will talk about that. But I think that first it would be great just to understand a bit more about the context in which this development, this popularity, is becoming more apparent. So mm -hmm. let, let's take a look at stock. What do you think is behind this lack of stock? How would you uh, explain that? Um, well, again, I can only really speak from from our area, um, but what we have seen is that um, the same as lots of agents up and down the country, uh, the availability of homes um, quickly or rapidly edged away. Um, you know, as soon as, as soon as COVID hits in March 2020, and since that date, um, the uh, the usual. Um, numbers the agents would see um, just never really returned. Um, and I think probably the result of that is that certainly during the early stages of, um, of 2020 through to the summer of 2020, as a result of the pandemic, uh, prices had to be pretty keenly priced um, to, to, to acquire tenants. And there probably has been a reasonable number of tenants that secured themselves um, quite favourable rents back then. Um, that coupled with kind of the natural starting of the marketplace during the early part of 2020 meant that there was a frustration over prices probably for about a year. So there's probably quite a large number of tenants or residents in properties that have acquired themselves some very competitive rents. And then when it naturally came to the ending of their of their initial contracts, I've probably looked around the marketplace and quite, you know, reasonably thought to themselves that, well, there's there's little point in actually moving to a to another property. If it's going to then cost us at least another hundred pounds per month. And I think that in itself, certainly as far as our area is concerned, definitely contributed to much lower numbers of um of fluidity to you know to, to to the usual availability numbers that that we would experience across all the property portals it's interesting actually because as you say it is that question of tenant movement you need the tenants to to want to move in order to uh, to keep that you know release some of that supply back out there for for other people to move yeah. in um, and I don't think it was just the I don't think it was just the rents either. I think if we kind of look at Milton Keynes as a real good example, um, I mean we have much smaller. I mean our Milton Keynes operation is 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 far larger than the Bedford and Cambridge operations, but Milton Keynes is probably a you know a reasonable good example to use as far as our own regional market is concerned because uh, Milton Keynes generally has quite a transient population because it's you know it's still a a young emerging city as it as it has been. Um, classified now as um, it's very common for and we, we have a high service sector banking industry professional services so there's no real grassroots employer that has a hold over that employment market 
and there are many PLCs and institutional employers then that that um, offer sustainable employment within the Milton Keynes area, and which means that there are lots of people moving into Milton Keynes and moving out, you know, after a two or three year period. And I think because again, COVID had a you know had a, such a dramatic influence over that transient employment, you know, that employment movement meant that even if people wanted to move for a start, their employers wouldn't allow them to do it anyway. Plus, there was more structured working from home, et cetera. And I think that all played, you know, as well as people obtaining themselves competitive rent levels in the, the, you know, um, the early to mid 2020s, I think the lack of movement in the employment market meant that people were just staying put where ordinarily they, they, they would move on. So it's quite huge in the Milton Keynes for the teams to be set up with a lot of the institutional employers um, uh, who may be running projects for an 18 or 24 month period. And then they would then get moved on to different projects elsewhere in the country that literally stopped overnight. So the competitive rent element to it, the, uh, the turning off of the uh, the employment um, transient marketplace, um, that coupled with investors choosing not to purchase um, property in great numbers, it was still happening. There was, you know, we 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 still had good experience of investors buying property through COVID, um, but the numbers were greatly reduced. And I think those three main areas fed into um, an issue from an you know from the agent's point of view that it was perceived that the stock was half the level of what it would normally be. Um, it's an interesting aspect because the stock hasn't reduced, the properties are still there. It's just that the agents still retain them with, with occupants in them already. Um, what agents are referring to is the availability of property for the demanding applicants who are who are seeking homes now and that that in itself obviously is a bit of an issue that almost highlights the long-term issue or it's sort of i suppose that yes, when tenants are more freely moving it 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 hides the fact that that housing stock isn't there because they can just shift and somebody will leave and they can you know so it's, it is a bit easier to find those properties but now that tenants yeah. are perhaps sticking there a bit longer it's it's just making this problem a bit more visible even if it has always been in existence yeah exactly i mean that's an interesting aspect that you refer to as hiding it i mean i think if you ask most agents um you know they they wouldn't refer to it as being hidden you know they they know that it's there but but the the ebb and flow of those figures then does thinly veil over um over the issue that there's just not enough property for people mm. but it is being disguised by the fact that you have that ebb and flow of people moving in and out of property creates the illusion that there is that there is available property for, yeah. for people but in reality you know there, there 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 wasn't then and there isn't now so what is the answer to that moving forward i mean the you know commentators and um other press institutions you know would would obviously have us all believe that the government want to get rid of landlords and i think that there is some truth in that but at the same time the private landlord still offers a large percentage of homes to the private rental sector. So to have a theory that the government wants to get rid of private landlords, I think is probably missing the point. I think where the highlight should be shone is on other alternatives to private landlords, because I don't believe that drumming the private landlord out of the private rental sector is going to wave a magic wand and you know and, and take away the supply issue no no well of course not i mean uh, as you say that those houses will still be there if even if these um, landlords leave but um it's true that the landlords are required because there are always going to be a certain number of of individuals people households that do need to rent you know not everybody can afford to buy so those rental properties are always going to be needed um, and mm. it's just how the government encourages or not or where they put their investment um, to actually support um, to support those tenants that that do need those rented properties yeah i mean the last figures that i looked at which was on the english housing survey so that's a report that was um 
commissioned by the Ministry for Housing, Communities and Local Government, uh, or HCLG as they're referred to now, um, that that showed that 4.4 million um, homes are in the private rental sector. So this is just in England itself. Um, so 4.4 million homes in the private rental sector. That that equated to 19% of all households. So basically, one you know, almost one in five households are in the private rental sector. Four million then are in the social housing sector, and certainly that's one area that is under supplied to you know to certainly older tenants out there. I'd be interested to kind of just kick around some some of the arguments with you over the build to rent because I think the build to rent model certainly addresses and will 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 offer great benefit to a percentage of the overall private rental sector but at the same time it completely misses um another sector on the private rental sector because i think the build to rent side is more geared to younger tenants as opposed to middle or older tenants mm. No, um, but that report, yeah, that report showed that 16% are in the, the social housing sector and then the remaining 65% of all households are, are home ownership, which is fine because obviously that that's not an issue. Yeah. But going back to your original question in terms of lack of stock, um, just by looking at our figures alone, in the last year, we've seen about a 30% increase in the availability of homes. So... The stock is coming back. It's not coming back in any droves that is going to automatically address the demand. But the shift has changed and those homes are now starting to come back on. Now, again, that could be a combination of two factors. Uh, Well, it could be a combination of three three factors. It could be that investment buyers are out there in droves buying more property, which I don't believe is the case. I mean, you know, we've certainly seen healthy numbers of investors still acquiring property through our sales departments, um, but they're not returning in droves, that's for sure. I think, moreover, it's probably a case of a combination of one residence in, in property and now starting to see that the, um, you know, the initial discounted rents that they had through lockdown are now being um, addressed and being pushed to, you know, to, 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 to higher levels. Um, but also, I think it's the, probably the main aspect is that the well itself is now starting to get back onto its feet again as far as that, you know, that 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 general business activity and the employment aspect. Mm. Um, so people return into their office, people return into a more structured employment model, I think is now starting to, to show that people are now naturally moving on with their lives. And that in itself then is starting to free up some of these property properties now. And you know, certainly in our area, let's say, of Milton Keynes. So for every person moving out of one of our properties and leaving Milton Keynes, unfortunately, there's about 10 people that are either here at the moment or are coming into Milton Keynes wanting wanting that property, um, which, which is great from a, an agent's point of view because it means that there is always a, a good supply of, of credible candidates or you know potential tenants of those properties, but of course that does place an unfortunate stress on rent increase and the sustainability of some of these rents that are you know, being, being charged at the moment. But that's that's something which is obviously completely completely different. Yeah. Um, so we're so we're we we're, we're kind of seeing um, you know out of that thirty percent increase, we are seeing a combination of. Um, properties coming back onto the market where tenants are proposing to leave, but also also new general listings as well. So it's not just that everyone's moving out of property. There are, there is more property that is starting to, you know, to come into to, to the local property market in Milton Keynes. And what um, the new listings which are starting to crop up? What type of profile of landlord are they, would you say? I mean, are they portfolio landlords, accidental landlords? Are they built to rent investors, you know, sort of coming forward with blocks of, um, of properties, of flats available? Um, I mean, the accidental landlord aspect is um, is not something really that, that, that we come across. I mean, it's certainly something that happened. I mean, it kind of happened a lot in my career during the early 90s with the extremely high interest rates you know the um 
the massive fall in property prices created landlords that ordinarily would have sold their properties and moved on. Um, and then kind of in, you know, kind of the, you know, the last financial crash where again, you had a similar, but not necessarily as deeply cut in reduction in, in capital prices created landlords that again, ordinarily would have sold their properties, but, but they were forced to let them out in the interim. And some of those landlords who became accidental landlords um, ended up remaining. So out, out of those people that rented property that ordinarily ordinarily they wouldn't have been involved with probably 50 percent of those are still are still landlords um, and probably haven't looked back since they made that decision so an accidental landlord is not necessarily a bad thing and um, obviously it, it offers that that those individuals a positive alternative to an otherwise bleak um, you know um, viewpoint but generally um, we see um, you know more we see a combination of landlords that are looking to switch allegiance between between agents, and that's been something quite interesting to look at. I mean, we've we've acquired agents ourselves and built our and, and built further on our our portfolio, um, and in some respects, that can offer some challenges. Where if you buy smaller agents, they kind of have more of a personal approach to what they do. Where from our side, the problem is is that where you're one of the larger agents, you're you know you typically then rely more on structure and procedure as opposed to personality. So sometimes that can be a bit of a um, a, a, a bit of a trade-off. We picked up some of those some of those landlords where maybe much larger institutional agents have come into the marketplace and acquired portfolios or acquired agents. And, you know, and they really have a problem then to try to address that personal connection. with the, with the bank. So we picked up some of those landlords. But also, like I said, there's been investment buyers that have quietly and steadily, from, from what we can, we can gauge here, quietly and steadily continues to buy property. I mean, the encouragement of capital price increase over the last two years anyway has certainly, I mean, who, who, who knew at the beginning of, of, of lockdown that prices would increase as they did? I mean, I don't think there was any commentators that were, that were predicting that. And if they were, they certainly had quiet voices. So I think that, that's, that's offered, you know, some good encouragement to, to, to landlords to continue to grow their portfolios. In terms of these types of investors, then, what kind of percentage, an estimated percentage, would you would you say are um, investing or more, perhaps more the institutional investors as well? How, how much of that investment is going into the build to rent sector right now? Is that something that's was small and is growing now quite a bit or has it always been quite a larger percentage? No, 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 no. It's, it's, it's definitely smaller from, well, again, when you say institutional investors, you know, at the moment, there is a, a small pool of, you know, credible um, institutional corporate investors, um, of which we've had involvement with them, with the likes of Granger PLC, who the guys then that successfully redeveloped the Olympic Park at Stratford. Um, and our, I, I believe are still the private, you know, the, the, the largest private landlords in the UK. I think there is appetite, I believe, from Lloyds Bank to to, to start to grow their own build to rent portfolio moving forward. And I believe that you know over a five to seven year, they expect to be uh, the UK's number one. Um, but of course, that remains to be seen. But but there's certainly other, you know. Um, seriously capital financed um, institutional investors that are now, you know, and corporations that are now looking at the private rental sector as a credible means for pension investment, you know, for the future, you know. So if nothing else over the last 20 years, the private rental sector has gone from a sleepy, dusty, quite archaic way of handling residents in property to now starting to push forward with nice, slick customer service, IT interactive um, tenancies that the, the buying public have have real confidence in. And of course, 
the build to rent sector now are you know are very much taking note that this is a you know a credible way to you know to fund those capital projects moving forward not least if you look over the last 20 to 30 years um one the you know the percentage in, you know the the increase in the private rental sector anyway um you know kind of the early 90s it was around 11 percent of households in the private rental sector and as i've as i said you know that's 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 almost double that now and it's you know and it's set to increase as we go through the next 20 to 30 years and i certainly think that the average person in the street um you know having more involvement with continental europe and you know, northern and northeast, um, um, you know, America that has a, a a high rental population that, you know, is aspirational in itself. So renting property nowadays is no longer considered to be the poor option for, for the residents. You know, it is a social and employment lifestyle requirement of, of, of many people. And that's certainly what we see. Yeah. I guess let's let's stick on that topic for a, for for a bit. I mean, uh, for younger tenants, perhaps uh, professional tenants, and so on. I mean, would you say that that's the type of profile really that the build to rent sector that's that's who that's targeting? I mean, is there a place for that for older tenants as well? I mean, um, how, how do you think that this will balance that demand across generations? I think that uh, I, I think the I think from the build to rent operators' point of view, they probably wouldn't they, I think they would probably would would prefer to have a mixture within within all of their developments between young and old but I think the reality is that both the type of building and again I can only speak from 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 our own our, our own viewpoint in Milton Keynes um in, where in in the likes of you know more more highly dense metropolis areas there probably is a much greater mixture of age groups in in apartments, let's say, because that that seems to be the go to model that the build to rent operators want to use, because of course they can put an awful lot on a a small square area um, if they build upwards than if they build out across the land for a start. Mm. So in in the Milton Keynes area, certainly the uh, the vast majority of uh, of of apartments that we that we offer go to the younger type of occupant. So our figures show that 64% of our tenants are aged 21 to 30. The other 15% um, is aged 31 to 40. Another 15% is 41 to 50, and then 6% are under 21. Um, so with the types of property that we let, um, almost two thirds, or sorry, over, over two thirds is, um, sorry, just slightly under two thirds is with um, ages between twenty one and thirty, which is what I think, kind of the you know the classic demographic that the build to rent operators are looking for, and I think also they're probably looking to captivate a marketplace that is not going to decide to go off and buy a property. I haven't looked at the actual figures recently, but, um, you know, uh, uh, you know, a couple of years ago, I think it was indicating that the average first time buyer now is kind of approaching the age of 35. So if the build to rent operators then want to put a model in place where the vast percentage of occupants then potentially are going to go up and buy a property they then quickly have a structure then that doesn't work for them financially so if they if they build property then that is naturally attracting that that larger so in this case you know just slightly below two-thirds of of the types of tenants that we deal with if they offer that type of product product to that percentage group then they have a much better success rate of sustaining that model moving forward yeah. Unfortunately, I think for middle-aged and older tenants, um, the build-to-rent model, as far as apartments are concerned, particularly in the schemes area, is probably something that, that those guys are not going to want to get involved with. Which is where the likes of social housing then need to, you know, need, need to fill that void. 
So if there is, and I think what probably needs to happen, and I'm sure it's probably happening behind, behind the scenes, you know, people with bigger brains than me, I'm sure are sorting it out. And that is that there needs to be some joined up language and communication between the built to rent operators and, and, the, and, you know, both the government and social housing, you know, housing associations themselves, because there's no point the housing associations looking to offer a similar product to what the build to rent operators are going to be offering, because then they're competing for the same marketplace. Um, if we look at the two the two middle groups, so there's so there's thirty percent of tenants then between thirty one and fifty, that the social housing, um, the housing association organisations could 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 quite easily then look to service that that particular marketplace. Mm. I don't think that there is a you know I don't think the build to rent model is something that's going to cure the uh, the, the private rental sector overnight. Um, I mean, it's you know, I mean, if you look at the numbers that are coming through, it's going to take probably 20 years, you know, before it then starts to have a have a real impact in um, in local societies. Um, but we're certainly seeing in Milton Keynes that 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 process has started. It's just a case of how quick that will run through. There are a lot of statistics around the fact that the build to rent model tends to be more south of the UK rather than up north. I mean, do you see it expanding and becoming more popular up north? I suppose I say this and obviously there are some bigger cities where where it is a bit more embedded. But do you think that this is a very specific type of city or town that um, that it will become a bit more of a solution to the housing stock issue? Well, as far as Milton Keynes is concerned, yeah, 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 I do. I think that that will that will definitely be a structure that. Well, it, we're already seeing that it's a structure that is coming through now. Um, the the interesting aspect from our point of view will be how that plays out as far as prices are concerned. So, um, typically, the build to rent operators at the moment are certainly coming into the marketplace and pushing rent levels ever higher, which is great from their their business model point of view. Um, but it's it's just a case of then how sustainable that's going to be once there are more operators within within the local marketplace, um, yeah. and of course you know but, but basic, basic economics will will play out that if there's too much supply of something then well then something has to give and that's generally prices. So yeah. I'm sure there is you know I'm sure there's some structure there that they that they will understand. Um, um, but I think from the private landlord's point of view. Um, the the you know the encouragement that we see with the build to rent operators coming in. I mean, you know, I'm, I'm sure you know us the same as I'm, I'm sure other agents like us would would very much like to have uh, business relationships with these with these build to rent operators. Um, it will be interesting to see how the how the sustainability of that property management side in terms of having having people on the ground in the area uh, plays out. So, you know, I think that the public will be perfectly happy to pay the prices that, that the build to rent operators are are charging. I mean there certainly are some, you know, some nice fringe benefits from from a build to rent community point of view. You're typically then going to be living in buildings with uh, with residents from similar backgrounds for a start there's some nice lifestyle aspects of those buildings with kind of chill out areas and gyms and um you know internal and external event areas um that that, that can be hired or, or or just generally used i mean a lot of the guys now are kind of structuring that there's high um you know the, the connectivity within the building is is definitely high speed um, a lot of them now are offering concierge service and parcel drop-off facilities, etc. Um, and plus, if they're looking for it, then you know a lot of these apartments come with, you know, quite temp- contemporary furnishings. So, um, I'm not the type of person that has watched Love Island, but I've seen the clips, and I can just imagine that the build, you know, some of the buildings that are kind of coming through in Milton Keynes at the moment kind of give that type of vibe, if that's the right word to use, um, which is another reason why I know that that's not the type of product that a middle-aged or older person is going to be happy to live in. Um, so when when the private sector, you know, when, you know, when, when, Older tenants or older occupants um, are looking for homes, and if there, you know, and if there is a model out there to supply to that to that type of marketplace, from certainly from the HA's point of view, 
it would it would certainly make sense to me that they don't compete with the build to rent operators. Yeah, no, that's that's an interesting delineation actually in terms of where the build to rent market can perhaps help. Um, the fact that it is perhaps targeted towards this this younger demographic, perhaps those that are looking for a, I don't know a sense of community, I suppose, which is what's being fostered in in these um, in these build to rent buildings. Um, I think that the idea of co living as well, it's sort of a bit in, interconnected. But it will, yeah, it will, yeah, yeah. It will perhaps be interesting to see, though, obviously the cost of living and the fact that costs are rising everywhere. You know, rents are generally um, higher across the board, regardless of whether it's built to rent or whether uh, or whether it's buy to let as well. Um, I suppose that it will be interesting to see whether that factors into how popular these these types of uh, flats, these types of uh, properties are going forwards too. Well, I think I think all the evidence is showing that they are they are very popular. Um, yeah. And at the moment, that doesn't seem to be a marketplace which is which is slowing down. Um, I think, like I said before, you know, the, the interesting aspect is, you know, not not whether the, the you know whether the, the build to rent scheme um, philosophy and price and structure is is wrong because it isn't. It's, it's it's very right and it's and it's very now for for a certain sector of society. Um, it. It would be interesting to see how that pricing structure moves forward and how service um, plays out in terms of, you know, um, retaining your 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 customers. Because certainly that's how the model would need to look at it. The, that they are paying customers, so essentially you've got you've got to keep the customers happy. Yeah, no, that that makes complete sense. I mean, it does seem that. This is relatively niche in terms of the solution that it can provide, you know, quite focused in terms of the demographic and the type of tenant and obviously in, ty- in terms of the type of investor um, that's looking for that type of opportunity. But it's definitely something which will continue to, to grow in popularity when that while that tenant demand is there. Even if the cost of living crisis doesn't seem to be stopping that demand, then uh, it seems that it will just continue to grow. Yeah, I mean, I think, well, I think I, I suppose the issue, the, the problem with the cost, cost of living crisis is what? Well, not the problem, but you know, but one of the problems with it is that, however much it's an issue, people still need to live somewhere, and then people then need to decide what's what's important to them. And um, at the moment, we see that 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 housing, or you know, that, that let's say you know, apartment living within the central area um, of of Milton Keynes is still very much in demand. Tenants are still paying top prices. Um, and for every person then that doesn't want to pay it, there's five people behind them that that that, that definitely will. So the build to rent operators understand that that there is that strong demand at the moment, and there doesn't seem to be any any letdown in um, in the desire for, for for these properties. And people are very much prepared to pay the price, um, but but the demographics are are, are limited. Um, I think, but you know, the benefit that it offers is that it definitely plays to that younger marketplace. So it, you know, so if the build to rent operators can definitely, you know, continue to to service that that age group, which we just said was sixty four percent, then that sixty four percent then doesn't need to go and let property in other areas where ordinarily they probably would do because they may not get. The types of property that they want in a certain area. This is just, there's, it, it's just oversubscribed, massively oversubscribed. So, if nothing else, the build to rent operators should be look at should be looked at in terms of they are they are delivering a solution, but it's not the solution to the property sector. You know, the the, the, the proper rental sector itself. It is a solution to a certain demographic within the overall private rental sector. Other stakeholders then, of which housing associations and private landlords, et cetera, can then play their part in servicing the other percentages, the other available percentage within the private rental sector. But who knows? But, you know, from, from, from what we can see in this area, it's a success story. Collectively, 400 homes that are, that are coming through. Um, I think over the course of the next five years, there's around about 3,000 apartments that potentially get built in the Milton Keynes area. So that's what I mean in terms of, it'd be interesting to see how, how the pricing structures work out once there is a continual 
increase in the availability of these types of property coming through. But I don't think that that is an issue um, because, like I said, um, it, it certainly then means that the younger style occupants are being delivered a product that they are perfectly happy to pay for in that aspirational sense. These operators you know, can see that there is a strong emerging marketplace um, and if we want to have a more sustainable level employment market across the UK, then young people have got to have an opportunity, you know, to live in the types of property that they want to. I think I think it's all good. It's all good, Suzanne. You know, I don't I don't think anyone should be should be concerned about this. I, I certainly think that agents, you know, should be embracing this type of marketplace. Um, you know, even if they don't have um, relationships with some of these build operators, you know, kind of the SME style um, invest, you know, investment companies. There's a couple of those that we let uh, property for, and again, they have a similar situation. They have blocks of about 90 apartments um, in, in 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 blocks, um, and they're you know they they're all furnished exactly the same. The types of tenants that that we acquire are. are from kind of similar backgrounds, they don't play into that central of St Keynes market. They're outside um, in in the you know the more traditional developments, but those companies are now starting to come through. Even smaller companies with reasonable budgets are looking at the you know the build to rent structure as a way in which to you know to to, to fund their company pensions moving forward. I think that seems to be a main driving aspect at the moment as to why it's a sustainable model moving moving forward yeah no well i think that as you say it all sounds very positive and it does seem that you know there's obviously still plenty of space for for everybody to operate it in the sector whether it's built to rent buy to let and so on and lots yeah, of definitely. opportunities there for for agents as well to work with these different types of investors and different types of uh, portfolio owners so hopefully it'll it'll help in the future and make sure that tenants get the supply that they need and make sure that they always have the housing that's that's required so uh, yeah. well i think i think i think also from 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 the tenants' point of view, you know, ultimately they, they they will be the customer, so they will vote with their feet as to who they think are the best build to rent, you know, um, landlord to to let property from. So, you know, the fact that there are different types of operators now starting to come into the marketplace, I think, is generally a good thing. That creates a bit of competitiveness as far as the the pricing structures are concerned. It then ensures that each build to rent operator then has got to be on their metal as far as the, you know, the types of customer service and the, you know, the quality of the environments that they're looking to offer. I mean, I suppose similar to a lot of the hotels, you know, in the way in which they are looking to court that type of marketplace. I say, bring it on, you know, let's 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 see the build to rent operators really start to, you know, come through in numbers now. One because it offers the buying public then a you know a, a another product to to choose from, um, but equally uh, and more importantly, I think from most um, agents and their their their, their landlord clients, it means then that that they probably will have you know slightly older tenants then looking to op- occupy their properties that will probably stay longer. Well, uh, I, I would suggest then that uh, we should book in some time in a few years' time to record another podcast just to see, uh, just to just see whether to your, your predictions have come true and <laughs> whether uh, right. see what states. Now, uh, now I, I I learned a long time ago never predict what the future was going to hold. <laughs> no, well, that, that's fair enough. But I think I think that, that it's been a very interesting conversation. I do think that, uh, as you say, it's something for for listeners out there to to consider this this particular sector, which obviously is is bigger in some areas than others and I think it's something that they should perhaps have on their radar as it continues to grow Um, so thank you ever so much Mark for, for joining me today it's been a really interesting conversation you're welcome nice speaking to you Suzanne